Sonic Speaks. Tonight on Sonic Speaks, we have our annual guest to start off the new season, and with our entry into the second decade of podcasting, who better than writer, director, actor, and the little engine that could of Dakota Ring Theater that keeps chugging its way into their own second decade, the modern pulp master Greg Taylor. Greg, how are you this dark and early morning? Well, I'm I'm very well. I'm always up at this hour, but very rarely speaking, so I'm pleasantly surprised to find myself in decent voice. <laughs> I'm interrupting your writing time, aren't I? What are you working on currently? Um, I'm actually dithering on an outline right now uh, on a, a kid's book, a, a second in a series that I'm uh, trying to pedal the first one and working on the second one at the same time. So. Wow, you keep busy. Uh, it, is, uh, it is about an 11-year-old uh, detective uh, named Abigail Brannigan, who in the first book takes a case to uh, find a missing cat. What's that like writing uh, children's novels? It's a whole different ballgame. It's completely different uh, and very familiar. Um, and, I mean, first of all, I read an appalling amount of... <laughs> <laughs> middle grade books at this point uh, with Max um, but uh, uh, yeah a, a few a couple of years ago I was uh, approached um, by uh, someone that I know who uh, has a company that uh, does a lot of interactive components called Stitch Media yep. um, and they do interactive components for uh, television and for well anybody really that needs some um, when people say, you know what we need? We need to be interactive. Then they call Stitch Media and they get them interactive. Uh, and he had this uh, dream about a, a series of um, books for young readers that in between each chapter would have uh, an interactive element that directly sort of draws the reader into the story. Mm -hmm. And they had a few people working on them and uh, he wanted to develop this whole line. He asked if I would take a, a crack at, at pitching. So I pitched a, a couple of titles and they went for one. Uh, it was called Capes in the Family and is about a, a couple of boys who realize that the family business is and always has been superheroing. And they discover their uh, their roles in that when, they're, uh, when their grandparents are kidnapped by a, an army of flying robots. <laughs> uh, and that was uh, super fun. It was really peculiar because the nature of the every chapter there's an interaction creates a completely different story arc. It's like writing a, a serial, except the chapters are much shorter even than that. So it's you don't have that sort of smooth rolling arc that you often see plotted out. You have uh, like up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, and, uh, and figuring out the role of the interactive element because uh, Evan didn't want the reader to be just, you know, oh, well, here's, you're done this chapter, and now you'll play a game or solve a puzzle and you'll get the next chapter. Mm -hmm. He wanted there to be a reason for it in the story and an actual role that belonged to the reader. Right. Once we found that voice, uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, uh, as the project proceeded, he asked if I would do two more. And I said, sure. So I worked those up. And uh, the, the first one is uh, coming out through... Uh, Stitch Media this fall. Uh, it is their first foray into printing something. They usually do things all electronic, so they've been having a lot of fun with that. Uh, I think quite literally, there have been some unboxing videos and things that I'm like, this is adorable. <laughs> <laughs> He's super excited. So that was fun, and they ran a Kickstarter in support of uh, the two books that were basically ready to go, and ran a Kickstarter in support of the next two so that they could do a full year of releases, and that succeeded. Mm -hmm. That was lovely, and uh, once I got through that and 
not actually through with it. I've uh, long ago sent them the second book, and then I sort of waited for notes. I'm like, they're working on stuff. I'm just going to go ahead and write the third one and assume that they don't have really any major problems with the second one that would require me taking out characters or something. Mm -hmm. So I wrote it and I sent it to them, and I'm like, whenever whenever you want to do notes and rewrites, we'll do them, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because they're working on getting the series established, and that's great. But it was a lot of fun to write, and it was something different. So uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, And then I stop for a bit and I'm like well what you know what's next um and my daughter is five. Oh, yeah, I can't believe she's five already <laughs> I know I know I know I imagine how I feel in uh, she chased a boy and tried to kiss him the other day I'm like this is all ahead of schedule I'm not <laughs> not good. really comfortable with this <laughs> and you know what I don't understand really why do they run <laughs> that's right <laughs> why why did we why run did when we that run happened what will question what what did we think? I mean, we just obviously didn't want our friends to see us kissing a girl, whereas, you know, 10 years later, we wanted nothing more than exactly that. Now, did, did you legitimately turn to your lovely wife, Clarissa, and say, this is all your fault? This is your side of the genes? Or this is, you know, this is the... Uh, no, 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 no. I, uh, um, I, I have learned the truth that all men learn <laughs> is that, uh, ultimately, uh, it's all all my fault, right? <laughs> uh, but... Uh, You've but been Tessa, uh, long about enough. six months. <laughs> That's right. No, never long enough. Never long enough. Uh, to, to realize the truth is what I'm suggesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I just wasn't going to get tripped up in your clever web of words, or that's, that's the kind of thing that gets a fellow in trouble. Then there's headlines. Taylor says married long enough. <laughs> Um, Tessa started having never really shown any particular sign of caring. About six months ago, I would say, oh, oh, look at this. This is on Netflix now. Now we should watch this. Or, hey, hey, look at this. Do you want to read this, guys? And uh, her question was always, is there a girl in it? Hmm. And sometimes I would, uh, you know what? There there isn't really mm-hmm. um, or yes there is but I knew darn well that it wasn't really a very good part and sometimes she would specify you know is there a girl in it that does more than get rescued mm. and I'm like okay so she's feeling this already mm. now I know that the um, the time frame when you get into publishing as opposed to putting stuff out yourself right. is glacial and maddening and frustrating and aggravating and hateful. Um, so uh, I thought I better aim something at the 10 or 11 year old Tessa mm-hmm. uh, if I'm going to start it now. So your, your cape stories though, what, what are the, what's the age that that's? The cape about? stories? Mm-hmm. It's hard for me to tell because my, Max, who is eight, is kind of freakishly advanced where reading is concerned. Right. So I write them to entertain him, Mm -hmm. but I consciously rein it in. Um, I think they'd like it to be 8 to 12, uh, younger Mm -hmm. if possible. Uh, They're an easy read for Max. Before you get into more about the Tessa story, because I'm curious, because I started writing just in the background sort of my own Hardy Boy stories with my sons. I don't know if they're ever be published or anything like that, but in Nova Scotia, there's so many treasures and secret pirate coves and, and perfect Hardy Boy style stories. So are there smugglers? Because you have to have smugglers. Yeah, of course. Um, and so all right, good. <laughs> but the thing is, I I'm always concerned about like um, vocabulary and how many words per chapter and all those kinds of things. Did you consciously think of those things while you're writing those down? I was like, oh, that's too big a word for people or, you know, what am I going to do about how, how much of this has got to be mostly dialogue and less description and all that kind of stuff? They're good with description. Uh, you know, you don't want to stop and do a page where you just kind of pointlessly describe the scenery, but I don't do that anyway. You mm-hmm. know, if I really decided that I was going to, you know, move into uh, Canadian literary fiction and write a 700-odd page rambling thing where the weather is a metaphor for someone's lousy marriage and, you know, after uh, after about three feet of book, a character has a revelation and then the book just stops. Um, yeah, I could do that, but I would, you know, hate myself and, and uh, I wouldn't even read it myself. of a young teen. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my Old gosh. Joy so, <laughs> I don't wander too far into that Mm -hmm. uh basically i just wrote it and then in the first rewrite i would go well that tone that down Mm -hmm. tone that down bring that back can you say that simpler Mm. um 
And uh, and then with capes, I had asked Evan when I was getting my marching orders. I'm like, you know, okay, so you want about how many words? Mm -hmm. And you want about how many chaps? So it's about this many pages per, and we're good. Good. Okay. And he's like, yeah, let's go with that. Um, so he, he had a, a really strong vision of where he wanted this to go. Mm -hmm. There was one thing that uh, through my own rewrites, and then I sent the manuscript in to him, and there was really only one thing that they pulled back. He's like, this perpetual motion machine joke uh, in chapter one is hilarious, but uh, no one, well, no, <laughs> no one's going to get that. Right. They're, gonna, they're not going to get past perpetual. I'm like, okay, well, it's fine. I'll, I'll turn it into a poop joke. Um, and, uh, well, not really, but, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll throttle it back a little bit. You know, I'll captain underpants it just a bit. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, it was fine. Uh, with, uh, Abigail Brannigan, I'm not there yet. Although, you know, again, uh, on my own reads through, my, I discover bits where I'm like, yeah, that's a little bit more Trixie Dixon than Abigail Brannigan. I need to sort of pull the vocabulary back a little bit, but there's also all sorts of opportunities in it, you know, where if someone... If the word has to be something that's a little bit up, um, the response can be because the, the client is younger. Mm -hmm. So the client can say, I don't know what that means. Right. And then we can clarify um, without sounding too much like an episode of Word Girl. But I love Word Girl. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not. It's an interesting process. It's always an interesting question because I, I sit there with my grade 10s and grade 9 students and I have them bring in their favorite book. And I bring in The Land of Oz because that's what my mother got me when I was a kid. And I read them the first couple of pages. And it's it's beyond most of their vocabulary. So our vocabulary as a society has really gotten smaller. So the question becomes, how much do you want to stretch kids? And how much do you not want to lose them? You know, you know, there's also an element, um, and I don't disagree. And certainly, you know, um, as a teacher, your, your experience is uh, is infinitely more valid than mine on the subject of shrinking vocabularies but it is also um the shift in grammatical structure yep is difficult for them um you know i uh, uh i found an old uh, in the 60s or 70s or, or somewhere there they did some uh, doc savage reprints as like hardcover books for kids this mm -hmm. is like a superhero adventure and they wow. they had changed a couple of things um there was one and they changed it to like the ghost legion from the spook legion because <laughs> spook meant ghost in 1930 and it meant something else in you know 1967 or whatever of course but uh other than that it was pretty much as it was in the 30s and you know max had expressed a desire to read some doc savage mm -hmm. so i i gave it to him he hasn't got into it yet and i know there's things where he's going to have a problem with because of the sentence structure they weren't really written for for eight-year-olds but he's not reading at an eight-year-old level mm -hmm. These are not complicated books. And when the time comes in working on the decoder ring scripts, uh, where I always have to, you step into as much as possible the voice and the grammatical structure and the word use um, that is typical of the period. Mm -hmm. And that's an awkward transition for contemporary readers and, and probably always has been. In, in some ways, it has to do with the vocabulary. And in other ways, it's just taking that, the narrative voice as a reader is your voice. I mean, that's particularly if it's if it's not a first person. If you're looking at something in, written in third person narration, mm -hmm. um, the the feeling is that the narrative voice is your own thoughts and your own way of picturing things. And when it's written in Yoda speak to you, <laughs> because of eighty or ninety years have changed the way that we put a sentence together, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a, a fundamental barrier. Um, and like anything else, it, it just requires practice. Mm -hmm. You move the Dakota Ring schedule back to the audio drama Dakota Ring style things to one release a month so that you could do many of these projects. What was the feedback from your fans? And we're not including my own that we heard last year on the interview, if you remember <laughs> that one. I do, I do. I'm <laughs> sorry about your dishes. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's been great. It's been completely smooth. And it really, it wasn't just that I didn't have time to work on other things. Like I didn't, at 24, bear in mind, you know, the, that change was longer ago for me because right. we still are like a year ahead of releases. Yes. So I transitioned from working on that schedule to working on our current schedule um, quite some time ago. Uh, and prior to that, it was like, honestly, I, uh, I do not know how long I could have maintained that pace and not just kind of drop down dead. Mm -hmm. Um, it was constant. Uh, and then it got less constant, but it's like, you've been running, carrying weights and you put them down you go, well, I could, 
I could carry some weights, <laughs> just not those big weights. <laughs> and so you carry some weights and you take on some other projects and then you find yourself creatively um, re-energized um, mm -hmm. by the option of working on something different. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's been a great pleasure and, uh, and a great opportunity. So do you, do you ever feel like your ideas for the both the Red Panda and Blackjack Justice are coming to an end? Remember, indeed, before you say anything, that the answer to that is no, Jack, not ever. Uh, no, I don't think so. There's there's uh, so many things that they can do, and they're both protected by by the format and the structure of the piece. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, with the Red Panda, because we have allowed time to pass, mm -hmm. and we can tell stories from throughout you know, about 15 years of continuity mm -hmm. um, in his time there's a lot to choose from and a, and a lot to uh, explore with blackjack the fact that so little has ever changed right. kind of protects it it's like they're in this you know lovely inner tube that they uh, i don't know what made me say inner tube but they're just sort of bouncing along um and oblivious to to the change in uh, in times mm -hmm. because it hasn't really well yeah, I, mean, they, I gotta stop there because i'm to thinking back i mean they have matured you're right there isn't physical time that's going on but blackjack talking and the trixie talking today you can tell that they have their their relationship is modified the voices of the characters i think there's a lot more maturity that has gone on through the years probably because you sort of found your pace too as time went by well, you know, that's, um, yeah, it's in uh, my writing, it's in Chris and Andrea's performances, because it's been us the entire time, and I suppose it's always the same actors, but very seldom is it the same writer, mm -hmm. or even small group of writers, for that extended a period. You know, you're not going back to a Bible, or uh, going back to a guide that tells you what happened and who people are and what the relationships are. You just know it because you've lived it with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, and physically we've had several Christmas episodes, so we know at least several years have gone by. Um, there was a reference that placed it, you know, sometime in the mid fifties. Right, and there is and uh, pre Jack's uh, relationship and post Jack, you know, in the middle of his relationship kind of thing with the nurse. And... It's true. Yeah. No, there's there's lots of stuff for them to do now, whether or not. In, in perpetuity, we, you know, we went from 12, uh, 24 episodes to 12 episodes. Will it always be that schedule? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think it'll always be something. Right. You know, you'd like there to be other opportunities for the characters and other opportunities for uh, me as a, as a writer. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some, some cool stuff that we want to work on in the months that are coming up. No, I don't think we're going to run out of material. Uh, I was very glad to get... Uh, as we recently have, bring the continuity story of the Red Panda um, to its uh, logical conclusion. I wanted to tell you about that because I, I read this cryptic message in Facebook before I had a chance to listen to the show. And it's like, I think it was Chris Moody. And he said something like, you know, after the last Red Panda, I'm worried about what's going to happen. And I went, oh my God, what's he done now? And so I, I went and I listened. And I had to admit, I was surprised at you giving the end of the Red Panda, the the, the red masked Hogtown hero. I was, is there, was there a sense of urgency to tell the beginning and the end of his his story for you? Well, there's no sense of, I think there's plainly no urgency in that, you know, I mean, I started writing this continuity of the Red Pan in 2004, mm -hmm. and we've been telling it constantly ever since with, you know, a hundred and some odd radio episodes and four novels and the digital comics and the trade paperback and all of these things. Right. Um, but when you've gone that far, into the single creator universe and you know like there are, you bring it back to uh the common cultural touch point of, of television shows after mash everybody wanted to do a last episode right. where you tie up everybody's you know but most com most half hour situation comedies do not require a last episode right. that's why they're often like the worst episode because <laughs> yeah, they right. do these terrible things and they ruin half the, and you're like well that's not how i wanted that to go mm -hmm. um you know like the last episode of mash mm -hmm. was a shared cultural 
um, point because you had to get them home. Yeah. We've put these people in this terrible place. The episode's not very good. No. And it was, at the time, it broke all kinds of records as the most watched it show It broke of all the time. New York City sewage system. Yeah. Everybody flushed at the same time. I it completely overwhelmed that. the New York City. That, that, is, that is a fact. Wow. But, like, Cheers? Mm -hmm. Seinfeld? Mm -hmm. These shows did not need a last episode. Friends did not need a final episode. Right. Like, you can just kind of let these things continue. Like Frasier. Um, and so I don't think, you know, <laughs> if I was, you know, carry on writing and a couple of years from now get hit by a bus, apart from the fact that there wouldn't be any new episodes, Jack and Trixie are fine. Yeah. They don't really have a thing that needs to be resolved. Mm -hmm. You know, they went on doing what they did and uh, everything was pretty much as it had been. You know, you can imagine whatever lovely retirement for them you want, but the story's not un finished. Um, right. Having started near the beginning of the Red Panda's career as a crime fighter uh, and allowed time to pass and carried on and built those relationships in a way that a superhero story almost never gets to do because they are written by committee and a continually changing right. um, creative teams and uh, and constant reboots and revealing their secret identity like spider-man and then no 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 we're gonna change that again <laughs> so, sure we're we're gonna change that and like erase your marriage that we're get that we're a mm -hmm. little sorry that we did by having satan directly intervene that happened mm -hmm. That's how mm -hmm. that happened. Um, uh, not That's to canon. slag on Marvel Comics, because DC Comics has done things way, way stupider than that. Um, yeah. But uh, this far, I don't want to. I don't want to too far down that rabbit hole, because I have all sorts of loudmouth opinions on the subject of, uh, <laughs> and uh, and no one cares to hear them. So I, I promise you, you don't want to hear them. <laughs> Having taken it that far, it would always feel unfinished if, for some reason we couldn't carry on. There was always that, and yes, it bothers me when people writing superhero stories talk about, you know, something as if realism mattered, you know, uh, <laughs> because two impossible things, one is not more impossible than the other. By definition, they are both equally impossible. They are impossible. Um, you know, like, Batman can't just have a l grapple line that pulls him up. It's, uh, you know, that would tear his arm out. Well, yes, it would. But <laughs> But flying with a cape made of memory cloth is not more realistic. It's just different. I'm fine with it. I didn't mind it. But don't talk about how it's more realistic because you sound like an idiot. But at the same time, you try and give them a base, an emotional truth, something that is uh, logical within the universe that you've created. The idea being yeah, that... These are fantasy stories that are built with their own logical reasonings that have to fit. yes yes but even even then even once you accept the idea that someone can with you know by having mastered the technique of using their the static shoes to attract and repel themselves over long distances could run over the rooftops and could do so with considerably less effort than actual just running mm -hmm. it's still you get to the point where you're like yeah but could they do it just as well as ever when they're 40 or 45 yeah. or w at what point are you saying you know when you've got a um uh, uh, and the red panda has some powers but mostly skills and mm -hmm gadgets um so you can't do it forever uh you know i mean you watch sports and you see that uh, you know guys who are peyton manning and tom brady are getting old i'm like yeah they're both younger than me so <laughs> shut up uh but uh but what they're trying to do is you know is a young man's game and to, th to look at it in the same way of how long can you do this and expect mm. to live and you you started that conversation and is that important at what point yeah. did it become Exactly. Yes, we started it a long time ago. We started it basically after they uh, mm -hmm. um, after they got married was the first time that he started to think about, you know, okay, maybe we need to find a way for this to be someone else's fight because I would quite like to live mm -hmm. now. Well, you have a reason now. Yeah. But then the war came along and it was all hands on deck. And mm -hmm. so there was no option of stopping and we carried on and you know he carried on and he did his duty and i felt like it was my duty to bring him to the place where he wanted to be and make sure that that was enshrined very much like when jack got married one of the very few changes that's happened in blackjack justice over the years um is that uh, uh jack found a girl and quickly uh wooed her mm -hmm. and and eventually married her 
and it's affected that people were like oh no that's going to ruin the show i'm like yeah 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 <laughs> just shut up um and it didn't it, yeah. it changed almost nothing uh you know d- because there's no reason for dot to be involved in yeah. in every show so she's referenced and she shows up every couple of seasons yeah. when she does get involved um and, you know i love having her on the show because it's a great role for julie florio but um it's you know it's not it didn't turn no. into a domestic sitcom exactly. because he got married. But yeah. he was miserable. Like it was, it was showing in the thing. He was desperately lonely and covering it up. And I'm like, you know what? I, we've talked about this before, about my um, Pirandello-esque uh, um, obligation to my characters. And I felt like I needed to, if I, in case something happened to me and I were to leave him, that I left him in a place where he could survive. Well, th- you know, Jack has more demons than than Trixie. And I think that those things aided him. And having somebody in his life m- made living a whole lot more bearable. Yeah, and uh, and it's probably, it's partly the war, but it's partly also just uh, other temperaments. Um, you, mm-hmm. know, uh, you know, different people want different things. Mm-hmm. People often say, you know, when is, uh, when is Trixie going to settle down? I'm like, well, I guess the day that it occurs to me that she wants, mm-hmm. right now I don't, I don't see it. Could it happen? Sure. You know, I, I don't think that needs to happen in order for the series to, I don't want to say stop, but, you know, be fully realized. Um, in fact, yep. I would need to come up with a damn good reason for that to happen for sure. without yep. making it something just arbitrary um, to the character and uh, counter to the character not really something that she wants she gets bored easily she moves on and yep. uh you know i certainly know people for whom that's true uh and, and she's that's too much of a flirt well you know, you know everybody in, in has that it would be very you'd have to have the right kind of person that could accept that well i haven't really i haven't even given it all that much thought because it's never occurred to me that it's what she actually wanted mm-hmm. she was on a toy for a while and then moves on mm-hmm. and that's okay so there wasn't urgency to return, and you've got to be at least a little bit impressed that I remembered what we were talking about, but there wasn't an <laughs> urgency to, uh, it's desperately out of character, to get to um, the conclusion of the story so much as there was the desire to have created an entire thing thing to have not merely Mm -hmm. uh any idiot can start a universe Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) you know you roll uh 3d6 six times and you've uh you've made a character and i guess now you've (laughs) kind of made a universe but if you put it in a drawer well you haven't really done anything have you Wow, you um, totally dated yourself with the 3D6 six times. <laughs> I don't think they use those anymore for for creating characters anymore. But they it's all toys. do they not? I I'll be I'll be completely honest. I go. I haven't played a role playing game of any kind since about 1988. Um, That's not because I don't you know like the idea, but Lord, when would I get the time? One thing I want to say about uh, Red Panda though that you kind of sort of didn't really mention. It wasn't that he just wanted to stop, but he had to stop and leave the legacy to somebody else he wasn't going to leave the city undefended no and there were several attempts to find the successor um that didn't work yeah. for one reason or John another was one of them um and uh, you know uh, uh training uh, uh mr amazing who mm-hmm. didn't seem like he was going to work out and then it did seem like he was going to work out and then he tragically was destroyed fighting the nazi ubermensch mm-hmm. and uh there's a there's a big it's a big canvas uh and in in a way i guess i always knew on some level it would be harry in the way that i always knew at some level it would be the mad monkey there at the end but (laughs) exactly how it was going to shake out well you you never really know until it's there Mm -hmm. yeah there was some trepidation and there are some people who still kind of they heard the message but they don't necessarily get that there's going to be a new red panda on october 1st and december 1st and that they're really not going to notice any sort of programming disruption in the foreseeable future Mm -hmm. so i i guess they'll be pleasant surprised <laughs> yeah uh, um, you know I tried to I tried to explain this but you know not everybody seems to be completely mm-hmm. uh, clear on the concept and and that's <laughs> that's okay um, you and know. I'm going to play in the Sonic Society our first show is going to be that quote-unquote final episode of the Red Panda the only concern I had after I listened to it was and I thought it was really well done and and honestly I think you did a great job of tying everything up to be able to give that kind of conclusion
version. So well done for that. My only concern that I would have as my own writer is thinking I would be more concerned about creating, for example, new villains now because they've never been mentioned. Well, first of all, lots of them have. Yes. Like there's all kinds of casual references that we've made to events and things and stuff and never really got into it. Mm -hmm. We actually skip from uh, August or September of 1939 until December 31st, 1940 in the in right. the story, like right before the invasion of Poland is when the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the final uh, battle with Nazi forces of uh, magic happens and the stranger basically removes uh, most magic from the world on a temporary basis and until mm -hmm. uh, we come back to the storyline. Kit is a reporter and has been for some time uh, and uh, and they have been um, fighting uh, a, a fifth column activities from someone called Archangel, who they can and we went with, and that was the format for for a year um, mm -hmm. where um, this had just happened. And uh, but there there was clearly great storyline. That was the the whole de development of that was you know mm -hmm. we didn't actually see her go in and ask for the job, and we're not going to now because that's you know sort of. Mm -hmm. burp fart theater we don't really need that mm -hmm. uh th there definitely are things that we haven't told there's also uh if you go back to the earliest days of the show uh, through the early part of the 30s the villains that they encountered were less likely to be a traditional super villain and more likely to be a villain that you might see in an episode of the shadow or the green hornet you know there were uh, green hornet style gangsters mm -hmm. who were terrorizing neighborhoods mm -hmm. and there were you know villains who they might have emerged to be that kind of bwahaha super villain but they were thwarted on their first go round uh, right. once you get back into that era it's not necessarily inexplicable that even if it's something that hasn't come up before yeah, and then you're right. I never thought if you got these, these you know, even quote unquote super villains that you thwart instantaneously, why 15 years later would you spend your time thinking about them when you've got, you know, the the Mad Monkey and the Clockwork and all those things that are going on that are constantly threatening. Yeah, so there's why would you care about somebody 12 years ago? There's uh there's stuff. There's interesting stuff. Sort of evolved a framework mechanism that uh, I think you'll get the hang of. Uh, over the next year or so, uh, where each episode is kind of the next thing that happens, but also not at all the next thing that happens, you know, where there is a particular reason mm -hmm. where they come to retell this story and then then you have the story, mm -hmm. um, a, a reference back to it, and, uh, and then you go on. There's still a progression, but there's an um, element of filling in the gap. Is the entire continuity in your head, or do you have, a, like, a massive Bible somewhere that you keep hidden in a sack of uh, or something? <laughs> yes, and if you catch me, I'll have to reveal the location to you. Uh, uh, no, it's it's all pretty much in uh, my delightful <laughs> coconut. I, uh, uh, by the time we actually could have used a series Bible, I had no time to create a series Bible. Uh, so I often use the internet hive mind <laughs> of, you know, if I'm writing something, I'll just post on the Facebook group and I'm like, hey guys, what's Mac Tully's uh, real first name? I have a feeling that it's Eugene, but I might be mixing him up with Flynn Rider. And, you know, 20 minutes later, I have 62 responses that say, yes, it's Eugene. And uh, I'm like, great. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to know. Wow. And uh, and that's like, that's super handy. Or, hey guys, in which episode did I say this? And, you know, you get the responses and then you find the line. So even if I'm fuzzy on details like that sometimes uh i you know i have the resource of mm -hmm. uh this uh, lovely committed audience that is uh uh, keen to participate in the process when they can. They were building a wiki at one point too, weren't they? Uh yeah, that happened. And but it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. and some people were doing a lot of work, and and uh, it, that's one thing that I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. Like I do not wish to I do not wish to do the Wikipedia page. I do not wish to be that guy that is building a lovely tribute to himself. And uh, there there actually was uh, at one point they had made several different uh, pages, and and one was deleted, and it was deleted by someone who works 
as a Wikipedia volunteer um, who is considered a deletist. Mm-hmm. They just go around deleting things. And he had made, like, seriously, he had made his own page. So you go around deleting stuff that's not important in Wikipedia, but there's a page about you. Ass hat. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I never wanted to be involved uh, in, in that. I'm like, yeah, I can't. I have only so much, so much RAM. Sure. Uh, also, if you're, if you're making your own Wikipedia page, you don't need a Wikipedia <laughs> Um, people have done it and I love them for it and they're very thorough and loving and it's interesting that ch- the choices that they make of what is important enough to be noted you know the periods of activity mm-hmm. come and go as people uh, are into it and then they're like wow <laughs> this is super boring uh, writing a wiki is super boring <laughs> yeah that's just that's one of the cool <laughs> things that happened along the way what have been since we've talked last in our last interview what's been some of the big highlights for drt in the last year releases and and things that you were involved in uh well i think we've talked about um the books you know some, of, some, some of the, some of the big news items how many comics did you have out last year? um yeah we had a couple of books come out so uh you know we had the second blackjack novel uh, come out and, and that did pretty well and the fourth uh, Red Panda novel and those are fun you know it's it's uh, super fun to, to write a novel for the direct market for a direct market that you mm-hmm. have made you know we have a great audience mm-hmm. but it's not we're not famous we're not even really internet <laughs> famous but there's a, a group of people that is significant enough to make it worthwhile to write a book for them if you're going to put it through the direct market and get an appropriate amount for it mm-hmm. uh, on, a, on a per book basis. And you look at that and say, wow, that was totally worth doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'll put that into vacation fund or, <laughs> or whatever. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's terrific. It's go- There's mm-hmm. a reason they don't publish pulp novels anymore. <laughs> it's because they're of <laughs> limited appeal in, in terms of your job is to sell to all of humanity. Mm-hmm. If your job is to take one of your 20,000 odd people who like download an episode in the first month that it's out and sell them a book uh, mm-hmm. well that's a pretty good cr- i mean if there was uh, a greater level of adoption of people who follow every episode religiously and will definitely spend 99 cents on a digital comic i, I probably mm-hmm. wouldn't have to do anything else even with that relatively right. small audience there they say you know all that uh, somebody talking about musicians and saying what the, all the musician actually needs is like a hundred true fans mm-hmm. um well i don't know if that's true it's just something that floated around there for a while but if you had a twenty thousand book sale uh, for a regular publishing company that would be a Best sure, but I don't mean to imply that we're selling twenty thousand of them. I just mean that that's how many people no, you have. But a, you have twenty thousand listeners. But that's sure. that's right? also realistically that's the total audience. So if you publish a book in North America mm-hmm. and it's going to be in bookstores, you can say, well, what's the population of North America? Because that's that's my potential audience. Um, and uh, you know, mm-hmm. whereas ours is like twenty thousand people. So. Even if they're super devoted, it doesn't mean they're going to buy your book necessarily, you know, but there's, you know, it's been good Mm -hmm. and it's been super fun to be able to write and create uh, in a different way and a different style and a bit of an archaic style, I guess, you know, like that's not already what I do. Um, and, uh, And it's been great. There's an element that as you approach the, I don't mean to sound derogatory by this, but as you approach the actual publishing industry, like the, there's still, there's an industry there um, right. that I've largely been ignoring, doing my own thing quite happily, which is something of a pattern in my life. <laughs> as the time comes to approach it, you, you do realize how much everything, you know, if you are telling someone who works for a publishing company in a letter or, or on the telephone or whatever about your podcast or the direct market novels that you've created for that audience. It's kind of like you're telling them that you just pooped in your hand and wiped it on the wall. They don't care and they're a little appalled. (laughs) That's that's a fact. I mean, and I'm sorry if that, you know, for I know that a lot of people uh, listening are involved in some level of creating their own thing and putting it out there. And on some level, a lot of people feel like Mm -hmm. this should get me to the next point. And they're right in that writing and creating is better than not writing and creating. And you will learn more from doing than from wishing. Mm -hmm. But the experience doesn't necessarily translate as work experience and when i and i'm kind of having that feeling you know now um trying to sort of uh, you know sending abigail brannigan around it is very familiar to me because it is also the story of my stage career where i was much more interested in Mm. doing things myself and spending a year preparing a play for a festival 
that would you know run nine or ten performances and then the end then mm -hmm. in doing things the normal way or you know working on uh, worked for a long time with a company that did shakespeare for high schools and we did everything um, you know, we'd, you know, work on the set, we'd, uh, you know, you're painting the thing, you're getting costumes together, you're, you're doing everything. And it was fantastic. And it right. was, you know, uh, and it was a steady kind of paying thing for a few years. And it was great. Mm -hmm. But because you're not doing the regular thing, uh, and particularly because it's, it's also primarily for schools, um, you're invisible. Right. Whereas what you're supposed to do is do hateful things like take an acting class being given by a casting director who is not an actor or an acting teacher and has nothing to teach you but if you pay to take their class they may remember you when the time comes to, to call people in for auditions and cast the them. Cast. That's how it works. <laughs> That's what you actually do if you want to be an actor whose job it is to be an actor. You do hateful, hateful stuff like right. that. And I didn't want to do it. And I was, you know, completely stubborn. Uh, and then after a while, you look at it and you say, okay, I have all this fantastic experience, but it is meaningless to the industry at large because I didn't care what the industry wanted and I did my own thing. Mm. That's very good until you actually want something from the industry. <laughs> and they say, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> that's and that's fine. And so I'm sort of uh, feeling that a little bit now of that perhaps I am what Coach Belichick would call an error repeater, but, uh, <laughs> or perhaps I simply have, you know, a pattern of behavior. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, looking at ways to bust out of that and to approach things with a little more patience for the way and the things that you actually have to do in an environment where I mean you know, I uh, for a number of years um, I was with somebody who uh, uh, worked in the publishing industry and through her came to understand the other side of things and uh, and what's involved I mean, the fact is, everybody wants to be a damn writer. Mm -hmm. Or so many everybody, so close to everybody, that yes. it's impossible to weed through and mm -hmm. find things. Because everybody over the age of 65 has decided to write their memoirs. And I'm like, you were an elementary school teacher for 42 years. I'm not saying that's not a valuable <laughs> life, but it's not, mm -hmm. no one is going to publish your memoir mm -hmm. because no one knows who you are. But somebody has to look at this. Yep. You know, I get it. I get why it's yep. difficult. But when the time comes mm -hmm. to approach it, it is, it is a uniquely uh, hateful experience and in its own way. <laughs> and I have really, I guess, not until we had this conversation about it really realized how much I am feeling the echoes of having to deal with auditions and uh, and all of that right. uh, stuff that I left behind have to do that anymore. when I joined the uh, yeah. the Dakota ring circus and uh, and s slipped away into the night <laughs> Uh, and that's not really, you know. I was wondering when when I was saying, you know, like, what are some of the highlights as well if you had, if you still had the radio station in Toronto and if you had those other things going on, like you had a radio station in Germany that was playing this this stuff and, and, and you had sort of been surprised to find out about it. So I was wondering how it was echoing out for new listeners that way as well. Uh, um, it... But in the end, I just wanted to ask the one sort of final question because I know we're rounding up in an hour and you've got things to do too uh so by all means answer that one but it we're into our second decade of podcasting you and i and you're giving me some of the lessons that you've learned in the first 10 years it, it, are there others too that you felt like you've learned you know everything is changing and if that sounds incredibly obvious it's because it is but even though it's obvious we don't always know it when we started this uh, podcasting was relatively new. People were super keen on it. Um, the media was curious about it. What will this be? And seemed like it could be anything. There has been, well, like, really, think about, you know, 2004, 2005 level technology now and compare it to where we are. The iPod, mm -hmm. because of the Apple marketing department, really it was the MP3 player, was a revolution. Mm -hmm. They made it about the iPod and good on them. That was their job. And by gosh, they did it. Uh, mm -hmm. iTunes was this thing that was, oh my gosh, they love podcasts. Well, they love podcasts because we were putting free product on the shelves of the store that they wanted to build so they could take over the music industry. And they did because they're extremely clever. Mm -hmm. But then they don't 
don't have to care about the the free content, and you know there is not very much in the way of <laughs> real podcast support from from iTunes, and that's not their job. No. But there's been incredible change. Like the the number one way that people use the internet to listen to music now is YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, and the the amount of music that is there is enormous. The amount of anything to listen to that is on YouTube is huge. People were... Everything is coming through streaming now. People, you know, and you wonder if this is where it's going. Is anyone going to download anything? Are they going to kill off <laughs> torrenting by making downloading irrelevant? By having everything you could possibly yeah. want available to you to stream? Right. That wasn't the case just a few years ago because everyone was, you know, oh, my bandwidth. I, you know, I only have so much bandwidth. And now that's becoming mm -hmm. just a silly thing to say. Right. Um, you know, speeds are getting faster and everything's getting faster. And it's fundamentally changing the way people interact with technology. This smartphone incorporating the MP3 player to being just one more thing that it does kind of limited the amount of, you know, it meant people always have it with them, but it also means they're not necessarily going to load it up the way you would, like a great big fat MP3 player, um, and have a library that you carry around, because that's also, like, it, there's lots of memory space, but it's also, f it's for your your camera and your video camera and and you've got movies on the people are watch people are streaming movies on their phones portability of uh, audio drama storytelling used to be its great strength everything's portable everything's everywhere mm -hmm. so i don't know what where that's going and what where that's going to be um We've started gradually re-releasing the back catalog onto YouTube, not really as a, like, just for fun, really. It's for fun and for archiving mm -hmm. purposes, um, because... Right. And we've done the same thing with the Sonic Society. Yeah. yeah. Will there be, you know, uh, you've created this completely ephemeral digital product. It's not even like someone can find a transcription disc. And if you find a machine that can play it, you can play it and see what's on it. What's an MP3? It's a mm -hmm. electrons. So <laughs> finding these different ways to keep the content in ways that people could theoretically access it if things change more and not leave you with having 200 episodes to transition into into whatever so i think yeah. we are at a crossroads where you know i mean in in the last year people were actually talking about podcasting again uh in you know serial was a thing and uh there are a couple of there are a couple of audio drama productions that i think have got you know, all the way to being at least internet famous. But both of them have recently stopped or are to some degree stopping in that they're, it's, um, you know, We're Alive and Thrilling Adventure Hour, right. both of whom, you know, reached a certain level, A, by being really good, and B, yeah. you know, associating through Nerdist Network. So certainly there's still things that can happen, but there isn't that same wide, dewy-eyed, the hills are alive with the sound of music feeling about this uh, borderless new medium. Say, you know, I think the borders have mm -hmm. been created and, uh, and, are, and are patrolled in their own ways. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we do what we do and uh, try and... Uh, have an effect. I mean, you know, we're storytellers. We we hope to earn your attention for as long as we've asked for it. And if we have that, and if there are people who are listening who are not a blood relative or someone we went to high school with, or uh, uh, you know, then we've done something. And if and if there isn't, then we haven't done something. Not for not trying, but uh, doesn't mean a thing, really, if no one's listening. What a perfect way to end the, the show. I ha! really appreciate Well, thank that. you for that, because I was mid-tirade great... there. That's good. No, and, and I mean, this is something you and I, like, I mean, I, as well as I want to hear everything you had to say about superheroes and comics at the time, but that's for our dinner table. The next time you and Clarissa and the kids uh, come or I come to see you guys. So I wanted to thank you again. It's, it's always a pleasure. I know how busy you are, and you always take the time to do this with me once a year it means the world to me well right? and you take the time to do this with uh with everyone out there who is doing this you know people who folks are listening to and and people who are you know in their own corner you know writing their crazy manifesto of how things must be and <laughs> playing to their audience of six and you're there for everybody and uh, and god bless you for it have a good day and you talk to you soon Bye -bye.
This has been an Electric Vicuna production. <laughs>